What do we have going? Malfunction. Maybe we should go somewhere else. Well, I think he's on. Okay, let me. Um, Pardon? Yeah, I'm going. Oh, wait a minute. We got it. Does this work? Yes. Okay. You are connected. I'll have to come over a little bit. All right. <laughs> Go right ahead, Mr. Hunter. Uh, my name is Bob Hunter. I'm a director of insurance at Consumer Federation of America. I have been Texas Insurance Commissioner in the past, and, uh, uh, and I've been involved in insurance consumer advocacy for 40 years, and after 15 years in the private sector, and 10 years as federal insurance administrator uh, at HUD, uh, which now is, of course, at FEMA. In the mid-1970s, America first faced its first liability crisis, and President Ford, uh, in my view, wisely created an interagency task force in 1975 to look into the cause and solutions of the problem. I was on that task force, um, and, and we made recommendations later under President Carter uh, uh, to, to do two things to change the annual statements of insurance companies so we'd have better data if we ever had faced another crisis like this. And two, we suggested that the pro product liability line was not competitive and needed greater coverage availability, and we proposed the creation of a Product Liability Risk Retention Act, a bill to achieve that was filed in 1979 and enacted in 1981. The 1981 uh, act was just product liability insurance coverage. We had another crisis in the mid-1980s, which was even worse. Um, rates were going up even faster and less um, availability. The second crisis we had the data, we saw that the problem was the economic cycle of the insurance industry, not a, an influx of claims. Uh, and and the, as president of the National Insurance Consumer Organization, I testified over the country uh, I testified in every state in 1986 and uh, several times here in Congress. In reaction, the Congress in 1986 voted to expand the Product Liability Risk Retention Act to what it is today, the Commercial Liability Risk Retention Act, in effect. Uh, in 2002, there was another uh, cri bit of a crisis in the wake of 9-11, and we proposed at that time expanding the Liability Risk Retention Act to cover all property casualty insurance to get over that trouble. Uh, that didn't happen. Today, I'm here to support a much narrower exp expansion ask, uh, under uh, House Resolution 4523 that asks uh, c Congress to require uh, those states with insurance markets that fail to address the property insurance need of nonprofit organizations to authorize only very experienced and very stable liability RRGs to provide the coverage. Risk retention groups that cover the liability insurance needs of nonprofit groups have served the nonprofit sector well over the past 30 years. Uh, nonprofits that also have property insurance need to go to the private commercial market for that coverage. However, there's a sig significant evidence that there's not a competitive market among private commercial carriers offering standalone property coverage. And in some states, in the wake of catastrophes, there's no market. In, in 2017, a study by Guy Carpenter was mentioned earlier found, uh, documented this problem. There was only one company writing standalone coverage, and we're told that that one company may leave the market, which would leave no companies. Uh, uh, writing this, the standalone coverage. Some say, well, why don't, you buy, why don't these nonprofits buy the uh, package policies like the business owner's package? The problem is that those policies don't cover what they need in liability. One of our member companies who, who does uh, consumer advocacy uh, was offered a policy, but it wouldn't cover consumer advocacy. Uh, and that was the only policy they could find. And so what we need is policies that are designed for these nonprofits, and these nonprofits deal with all kinds of tough situations. Us using volunteers, usually, they're into situations like homeless uh, situations, situations with abu uh, drug abuse, sexual abuse, all kinds of wonderful services that we really need. They need the kind of coverage that actually fits their, their model, their, their real risk. Uh, there's an important federal role in establishing the, the, this uh, eventuality. The bill is very safe, I think, and, and provides enough 
uh, protection for these consumers who are in effect who own these RRGs and, and they're insuring themselves really through these RRGs so they're not going to be try, try to just, uh, cheat each other uh, themselves and this, they do sh have strong standards for solvency in this bill no uh, no in, uh, RRG that has existed for 10 years or more which is the standard in the bill has ever gone insolvent um, now uh, some have said, well, what about, shouldn't they be in, uh, covered by the guarantee funds? And I, and I am willing to say that CFA would support amending the bill to, to allow risk retention acts to go into, the, into guarantee funds, although I don't think it's absolutely necessary the way the bill is drafted. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. The chair now recognizes Ms. Clara Lindley Myers for five minutes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Wait a minute. Let me get this. I stole it from her. He doesn't have theft insurance either. <laughs> Thank you for uh, the opportunity to testify here today. The NEIC believes that nonprofit organizations serve a critical role in our country, and we recognize the importance of ensuring they, that they have access to insurance that meets their need. We understand that some have raised concerns regarding the availability of commercial property coverage for nonprofits. They've also argued that H.R. 4523, the Nonprofit Property Protection Act, is the appropriate mechanism for addressing such concerns. On both accounts, we respectfully disagree. While the passage of the LRRA may have been viewed as appropriate in the 1980s to address a widespread availability crisis in the liability insurance market, no such crisis exists today in the commercial property insurance market. Traditional admitted carriers do provide coverage to small and medium-sized nonprofits, albeit several offer it in the form of a full business owner's policy that contains both liability and property coverages. Also, if there are limited options for a specific policyholder in the admitted markets, policyholders have access to surplus lines markets as well as the residual market. State insurance departments have received few, if any, complaints from nonprofit policyholders indicating that they are unable to obtain the coverage that they require. Notwithstanding any questions surrounding availability, we're troubled by the idea of less regulated RRGs providing commercial property coverage. Even though RRGs may operate in multiple states, they're only required to be licensed in one. And the regulatory authorities of non-domiciliary states are significantly curtailed. These limitations are significant because RRG policyholders do not get the benefit of the oversight that multiple sets of eyes can offer. This is particularly concerning as only 30% of, of all RRGs write business in their state of domicile, which means that state has limited firsthand exposure to the RRG's conduct and policyholders. Under H.R. 4523, an RRG already subject to weaker regulatory requirements based thousands of miles away with no presence in Missouri would be able to write property coverage for Missouri policyholders, and I would have limited oversight or ability to act to protect those policyholders should anything happen. I couldn't even conduct a market conduct examination to determine if they were bad actors. Further, while it is true all states are required to establish a baseline uh, level of regulatory requirements for RRGs to obtain NAIC accreditation, those requirements are specifically designed for the purpose of RRG regulation. They relate to the liability lines of business RRGs are entitled to write, are subject to the limitations in the LRRA, and are not the same as the admitted market. The minimum capital requirements are different. The types of assets that can be used for capital are different. The accounting basis can be different. And as a result, the threshold for intervention can be opaque to regulators. Historically, RRGs have had a higher rate of insolvencies. Over the past 10 years, RRGs entered receivership at nearly two times the failure rate of admitted carriers. In the event of an insolvency, RRG policyholders do not have the same protections as the admitted market. The LRRA prohibits RRGs from participating in the state guarantee fund system. So unlike buying from a traditional insurer, nonprofits have no safety net should their RRG fail. 
My written testimony provides additional details regarding options for RRGs that wish to provide property coverage to their members, such as converting to an admitted carrier or affiliating with one. Expansion of the LRRA, however, is not the appropriate solution. In conclusion, we're concerned that preempting the states to allow RRGs to sell commercial property co coverage would create more risk for RRGs and ultimately their policyholders. The limited oversight of non-domiciliary states in the RRG regulatory framework, coupled with the lack of state-run grant guarantee fund protection and increased risk of insolvencies associated with RRGs could expose nonprofit organizations and those who rely on them to unnecessary risk. I thank you for this opportunity to testify today and would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Director Lindley Myers. The chair now recognizes Ms. Ivory Robinson for five minutes. Chairman Clay, Vice President, or sorry, Vice Ranking Member Gooden and members of the subcommittee. I am Ivory Robinson, Vice President of ABD Insurance and Financial Services, an insurance broker. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the difficulties small community-based nonprofits face finding appropriate property casualty insurance. In doing so, I will describe my experience trying to obtain coverage for one of my clients, Black Lives Matter, and explain why I believe risk retention groups must be able to offer property insurance to their nonprofit members. ABD Insurance and Financial Services is one of the fastest growing private insurance firms in the United States. We work extensively directly with nonprofits to help them obtain property casualty insurance that is appropriate for them and that they can afford. Our clients serve our communities in a variety of ways. They help those with disabilities such as cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, and autism. They rescue thousands of pets, provide care for the sick and injured. They work with those addressing global problems including climate change, inequality, and food insecurity. While this variety and creativity is extremely good for our communities, it can be challenging for insurance companies to tailor affordable insurance for them. Even in in the best and most competitive of insurance markets, nonprofits always seem to be at a disadvantage. Out of the more than 150 companies that we represent and work with, only about 3%, yes, just 3%, are focused exclusively on helping nonprofits with specialty insurance that they need and helping them to thrive in the communities that they serve. None of those companies provide standalone property that small nonprofits need to pair with the liability insurance they obtain from their own risk retention groups. I began actively working with the risk retention group for nonprofits several years ago. As with all insurance companies I work with, I made sure that the risk retention group offered appropriate insurance policies, had a good reputation for fairly paying claims, and was financially strong. Unfortunately, there are a couple of trends occurring simultaneously in our industry right now that are making securable, securing affordable insurance even more difficult for small community-based nonprofits. First, there's an increasing trend towards automation within the insurance industry. While this makes good sense for insurance companies hoping to shrink their uh, operating margins, but it does not work well for organizations who are community-based like nonprofit. That does not fit into their underwriting box due to their own unique services that nonprofits offer. In addition, despite the opponent's assertion that there is no crisis at this time, the insurance industry right now is in one of the most hard markets we have seen in decades, which means sharp increases in premium for all policyholders in 2020 and beyond. The insurance markets have suffered record claims and losses due to wildfires, hurricanes, flood, increased litigation around sexual abuse, and we can expect, expect those trends to continue. This has resulted in decreased market capacity to provide coverages, increases in premiums as much as 100% for policyholders, and unprecedented numbers of cancellations and non-renewal. In fact, today, one of the largest nonprofits insurance companies and foreign brokers, they are canceling coverage for all foster care agencies, adoption, and housing-related nonprofits at renewal this year, which could, could begin as soon as March for bundled insurance products. I would like to close with one example of why it is extremely important that risk retention groups continue to exist. I am the insurance broker for Black Lives Matter. My experience of trying to find insurance for them has solidified my support for risk retention groups and their important role. 
particularly in supporting new and emerging community-based organizations and civil justice organizations. I spent nearly a year, endured rejections from over 90 traditional and ins admitted insurance carriers and companies with my efforts in trying to find coverage for Black Lives Matter. Insurance underwriters reacted to sensational headlines rather than examining the actual operations of this organization. Ultimately, it was nonprofits' own risk retention group that provided their necessary coverage. Without insurance, organizations like this cannot obtain financial support through fiscal sponsorship, rent facilities, receive permits to hold rallies, raise funds for government resources, engage in services that individuals are willing to provide um, for a volunteer basis for their nonprofit board members. I am proud of the industry I've chosen for my career, but this experience made me see very clearly how not having access to insurance can impede the important work of our community organizations. We have found that risk retention groups, uh, their solution to be an excellent one for small and mid-sized community-based nonprofits. We cannot st stress strongly enough how important it is that HR 4523 become law so that well-capitalized and seasoned risk retention groups are able to provide this important property insurance to their nonprofit members. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. The chair now recognizes Mr. Bergner for five minutes. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Gooden, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is John Bergner and I am the Assistant Vice President for Public Policy and Federal Affairs for the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. NAVIC membership includes more than 1,400 regional and local mutual insurance companies on main streets across America, as well as many of the country's largest national insurers. Though not 501c3s, mutual insurance companies are also not-for-profit organizations, which exist solely for the benefit of their policyholders, and so share a certain affinity for those entities that are the subject of today's hearing. In speaking on behalf of NAMIC's diverse and unique membership, which is made up of many of the nation's smallest insurers, we hope to provide a useful perspective for the conversation on nonprofit insurance and risk retention group expansion. I want to start by saying that NAMIC members are community leaders across America and support the work that many 501c3s do in our communities throughout the nation. However, we do not agree that a crisis exists in the commercial property market and believe that an expansion of the scope of risk retention groups would be unnecessary and inappropriate. Therefore, we are opposed to H.R. 4523, which we believe would needlessly undermine the state-based insurance regulatory system here in America. In short, NAMIC opposes H.R. 4523 for four key reasons. Number one, no national insurance availability crisis exists that would warrant circumventing longstanding state insurance regulations. Number two, because no crisis exists, allowing RRGs to offer commercial property and auto insurance would serve only to create an unlevel regulatory playing field and a competitive advantage for a handful of RRGs in this market. Number three, the RRG regulatory regime is substantially different and less rigorous, undermining consumer protections and potentially placing 501c3 policyholders at risk. And number four, states have already created more tailored and effective risk transfer mechanisms and alternative solutions for 501c3s. Simply put, NAMIC does not see compelling evidence that there is a national availability crisis in the commercial property insurance market for 501c3s. There are insurance coverages, including property coverage, available and, in some cases, marketed directly to nonprofit organizations. Allowing RRGs to sell the same commercial insurance products already offered in the admitted markets simply gives them an unfair competitive advantage over traditional insurance companies that abide by all of the regulatory standards and consumer protections of each state in which they operate. This is because, in contrast to admitted carriers, risk retention groups are allowed to operate nationwide, but they are only substantially subject to the regulations of the state in which they are domiciled. By definition, this means that there is less oversight by fewer regulators. Further, they are not required to participate in state guarantee funds designed to protect consumers. This arrangement was specifically designed to deal with a widely recognized crisis in commercial liability insurance markets in the 1980s. No such crisis exists today in the commercial property market. Even if one were to stipulate there was an available, availability issue for nonprofits, which we do not, it does not mean that passage of H.R. 4523 and the expansion of the RRG mandate is the only, best, or even an appropriate remedy. There are other mechanisms through which a nonprofit could effectively transfer its risk. If a nonprofit has real difficulty in finding the exact coverage it desires in the admitted market, it can have a broker go to the surplus lines market. 
In the event that an organization cannot find coverage in either the admitted or the surplus lines market, many states have residual market mechanisms, like fair plans, to which they can go to acquire a commercial property policy. And finally, in the event none of that works, a state could address any concerns about coverage availability on its own, working through the state insurance commissioners or the state legislatures on a tailored solution, like at least one state has already done in this space. NAMIC believes the issue is quite simple. If RRGs want to offer the same products as admitted insurers, they should play by the same rules. There was nothing novel about the structure of RRGs when they were created. The concept of an insurer that is owned and managed by and for the benefit of its policy holding members has been around since the first successful US mutual insurance company was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1752. I would note that company is still in existence today. Given that NAMIC's membership contains numerous smaller insurance companies that write in multiple states for niche markets, we would invite any RRG not satisfied with the statutory limitations on its offerings to strongly consider reorganizing as an admitted mutual insurance company. As I close, I think it is important to highlight the fact that state regulators, independent insurance agents, and the entire primary insurance industry all agree that HR 4523 would undermine the state-based system of insurance regulation and increase risk to consumers. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Bergner. The chair now recognizes Ms. Davis for five minutes. Chairman Clay, Vice Ranking Member Gooden, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify about the availability of insurance for nonprofit organizations and explain why the Nonprofit Property Protection Act is critical to assure uninterrupted insurance coverage for tens of thousands of nonprofit organizations. I'm the president, CEO, and founder of Alliance of Nonprofits for Insurance, Risk Retention Group, known as Annie, and I'm testifying on behalf today. Annie insures small and mid-sized community-based nonprofit organizations across the country, those in our neighborhoods who work with the most vulnerable among us. There are homeless shelters and programs for those with Alzheimer's, victims of abuse, and the developmentally disabled. There are animal rescues, elder care services, drug and alcohol rehabilitation centers, school arts programs, and faith-based organizations. 80% of the member insureds have annual budgets of less than a million dollars. These little nonprofits never wanted to be in the insurance business, but created their own insurance companies as risk retention groups against great odds because commercial insurance carriers abandoned them. And last year, any nonprofit's own risk retention group experienced a 30% increase in applications as commercial insurance companies once again non-renewed restricted coverage options and raised prices on nonprofits. This year, we have seen the trend continuing to escalate. And as an RRG, we've been successfully insuring these organizations for difficult liability risks such as auto, sexual abuse, and employment practices for decades. We also offer free consulting and educational services such as employment risk management and driver training to nonprofits whose small budgets do not allow them to, pro to provide and purchase these services. But our future ability to serve nonprofits is now in question. Commercial insurers, when they're willing to offer insurance for small nonprofits, provide it only as a bundled package. That is, small nonprofits must purchase the liability and the property together, similar to a triple play cable package. However, by federal law, risk retention groups are prohibited from offering property insurance to their members. Only one company in the country offers a standalone property insurance program appropriate for small and mid-sized nonprofits that are members of a risk retention group. This program is meant to address the market failure until other commercial co companies started to offer the product. Several years ago, the single company offering the property indicated that they tend to, intend to discontinue the program. We ask insurance brokers and agents who work with nonprofits to find other commercial insurance companies to provide the standalone property insurance for their clients. They told us in no uncertain terms there were no appropriate policies options available. Hearing that, we engaged Guy Carpenter to conduct an independent study to see whether there were insurance department filings that we had overlooked. Surely, some other carrier provides this coverage. Guy Carpenter's research turned up no viable commercial options for the standalone property form for small nonprofits. We have exhausted all of our options for a market-based solution. To provide consumer protections, the Nonprofit Property Protection Act has minimum capital and seasoning requirements before any risk retention group can offer property insurance. And to make sure this bill will only correct a market failure and not interfere with an otherwise well-functioning commercial property market, the bill has three additional provisions. One, 
risk retention groups may offer property insurance only to their members that are 501c3 nonprofit organizations. Two, any single nonprofit may be insured by a risk retention group only for up to 50 million in total insured value because it is presumed that larger nonprofits will be able to purchase these standalone coverages in the standard market. And this last point is critically important. No risk retention group may begin offering property insurance to its members if there are three licensed, admitted insurance companies offering these property coverages nonprofits need in a state as determined by the insurance commissioner. Let me emphasize that point. Under the provisions of this bill, any insurance commissioner can stop any risk retention group from beginning to offer property insurance simply by listing on its website three licensed admitted companies that write this coverage in that state. We have been asking insurance commissioners to provide us with the names of companies that will write this coverage for years, and they have not provided the name of a single company, nor have they suggested language to improve the bill. Every industry, even insurance, must make room for necessary and prudent innovation, like the Nonprofit Property Protection Act. Congress can correct a market failure that insurance commissioners and commercial insurance companies have either been unable or unwilling to fix. HR 4523, with HR 4523, nonprofits can solve this problem for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who is also the chair for the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses for appearing as well. Um, let me start with you, uh, if I may please, ma'am, uh, Ms. Uh, Lindley Myers. Uh, ma'am, you cited uh, a insolvency rate earlier, did you not? I, d I indicated that RRGs uh, is two times likely to fail. And uh, in citing your insolvency rate, uh, you did not address those with experience of 10 years or more. Is this correct? Well, the... Uh, is this correct? That have 10 years or more? Yes. Is it correct that you did not address them? I did not mention that at you all. You did not mention it. And is it true that with 10 years or more, we've never had a single insolvency? Is this true? It is. Uh, and you neglected to mention it. Um, is it true that uh, if you had your way, you would eliminate the RRGs? That's not true. You would keep them? If they, if they would operate under state, if, I would keep them if they would operate such that they would allow uh, uh, either combine themselves with a, a admitted carrier. Let me continue. Um, is it also true that you've read the bill? It is. You've read the bill? It is. That, I take it, yes, you've read the bill? I is, did. Okay. In reading the bill, did you happen to note over on page 4, line 24, uh, the statements that indicate that if there is a crisis, um, we, if there is no crisis, then there will be no RRG in a given state? by simply certifying that there is not a crisis? It indicates that if there is a, uh, if there is a crisis and the RRG is already operating, it doesn't say that they have to stop operating once uh, it's determined that no crisis exists. So if uh, the bill, were, if we amended the bill to include language to accommodate you, you would then support it? No. Because I, well, I feel... But then you, you, you just made the point that if there is no crisis, you would accept the bill. And if at some point the crisis does exist, if the crisis exists, you would accept the bill. But if there is no crisis, then you would want to return to a state wherein uh, the, the RRG would not be allowed to do business in the state. There is no crisis, and, because, and if there is an issue, as been mentioned uh, by the chair when he was giving his two minutes, uh, the, apparently the nonprofits have gone to states and said, hey, this is a problem for us in this state, and so therefore we want to correct it. Well, if, and in certain situations, may, those things are done. my time is quite limited. If there is a crisis, 
we have one circumstance. But if there is not a crisis, the authorities in the state but only have to certify that there exists three companies that provide this type of insurance. So, so we cover the circumstance of a crisis. If there is a crisis, then they won't operate in the state. If there isn't, then the uh, 501c3s can be accommodated. Um, let me ask you, uh, Ma'am, uh, the lady that represents Black Lives Matter, I can't quite read your name from here. So Ivory please. Robinson. Okay, Ms. Robinson. Yes. Um, tell me about the difficulty in acquiring insurance, please, for uh, an entity such as Black Lives Matter. Uh, sure. What it comes down to is because they, off, they do unique services, so not a one-size-fits-all type of organization, the stance of the insurance companies, if, if they don't feel comfortable with the risk, if they don't like any perceived liability based on whatever they find online or Google, whatever their own personal inferences are, they don't offer the coverage. This is why it took me more than a year. Um, and Black Lives Matter is one of many organizations that have this difficulty. As I mentioned in my experience, I work with hundreds of nonprofits. In my experience, I would just ask anyone on this panel if they have had direct um, experience in working with nonprofits to place this coverage as opposed to just the legislative side. Let me conclude with uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to put the 1,600 letters uh, supporting the legislation into the record. And I would like to close with the bill having covered the question of a crisis in terms of whether it exists or not. If there is a crisis, then they operate. If not, they can't operate in the state. And no company with 10 years of experience or more has ever failed, and you neglected to mention that. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gooden, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, the, the reason a state guarantee fund exists, I believe, which they're all active in all 50 states, is to protect policyholders if an insurance company defaults on benefit payments or becomes insolvent. Is that correct, Dr. Director Lindley Myers? That's correct. So can you tell me, do these risk retention groups, uh, do they have access to this uh, state guarantee fund? Do they have access? They do not. So what does that mean moving forward? If, if, we're, if, if we're using the history of no insolvencies as a benchmark, um, then why do we even need these state guarantee funds? The state guarantee funds exist to protect policyholders. If an RRG fails, they are not a part of the state guarantee fund, so therefore the assets of the nonprofit would have to be used to pay claims. If, they, if a company that is in the admitted market fails, then they have access to the guarantee fund. So if the RRG wants to expand their coverage, which I'm hearing today, why wouldn't they just become an admitted, an admitted carrier? Why wouldn't they go through? Are they being barred from that process? They are not being barred from that process. And as, been, as has been mentioned here today, if they found that there was an issue in a particular state, they have gone to that particular state's insurance commissioner and asked that this issue, whatever the issue may be, be, uh, uh, be taken care of in that particular state. And that's what has happened in the past. Ms. Davis, did you want to join in? I did. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the guarantee fund issue. We have always said, as we work through this legislation, that if uh, Congress wanted us to be part of the guarantee funds at the election of an insurance commissioner in a state, uh, for the benefit of writing the property insurance, we would be happy to do that. And, and we've always said that, and so uh, we would be happy to do that if that's something that you feel strongly about. I, I would also uh, like to speak a little bit about why we cannot become admitted, if you don't mind. Um, we did actually look into it. We've looked into every option we can possibly imagine to try to solve this problem before asking Congress to fix it. And uh, I did call an expert and suggested to him what we were planning to do, what we were hoping to do. And, and honestly, he, he laughed at me. He said, this is ridiculous. The, the path to being licensed and admitted for this small amount of property you're talking about for these little organizations just simply makes no sense. Nevertheless, we looked into it. But there is a specific reason why Alliance of Nonprofits for Insurance 
cannot become licensed and admitted. And, and the reason for that is that we're actually a 501c3 nonprofit ourselves. As an insurance company, there's a certain law, it's a federal law, it's called 501n under the IRS code. And we are tax exempt under that IRS code. And it requires us to be organized as a nonprofit under state laws provisions authorizing risk sharing arrangements for charitable organizations. There are only six states that al allow that and so we could not be licensed to visit it. in every state. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Mr. Bergner, did you want to add your thoughts on this matter? Uh, sure. I, I think we've, we've seen in the past um, that there have been several risk retention groups that have indeed reorganized to become admitted carriers. Um, I'm not familiar with the specifics of the, the, the federal uh, law that Ms. Davis was referring to in terms of the inability to reorganize. Um, might be happy to, to help try to amend that law uh, if that were the, the, the desire to try to um, uh, streamline the process for, for becoming an admitted carrier and then therefore playing by all the same rules. I would just you know, note that the NAMIC membership uh, is a great example that sort of belies the notion that you can't be an admitted carrier operating as a mutual in niche markets um, and, and be small with specific risks because that's what our members do every day on main streets across America. So, um, I would just leave you with that. Yes, Ms. Robinson, I have 30 seconds and you can have them all. Sure, I just want to add that when you talk about the guarantee funds, that's the notion that an insurance company or RRG goes out of business before that ever happens. We've noted that that's never happened in history if they've been in business over 10 years. Furthermore, I come from California. We, you've seen the, the wildfires that have occurred. In the last couple years, the only company that has gone out of business has been a traditional insurance carrier out of the Camp Fire and uh, Paradise Fire. So, and they are regulated, and they are backed by California Guarantee Insurance Funds. So I just wanna say that I don't, I'm just astonished at the fact that that's the, the fear-based kind of notion that we're hearing today, as opposed to the realities, which risk retention groups do not face. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the um, gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Tlaib, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all so much for being here. I uh, appreciate uh, coming from the nonprofit sector, kind of critical conversation of how do we cultivate an environment um, that allows uh, so many nonprofits uh, across the country, especially in 13 districts strong, um, to really, in some way, supplement for what government isn't doing uh, enough of. And so I wanted to ask, um, Ms. Robinson, you know, uh, it was a study that found like two th in th 2017, found that nonprofits have very few options when it comes to obtaining property um, insurance coverage, especially small, mid-sized. One of the things I wanted to ask is, is it just property insurance? What else does nonprofits need insurance for? Um, it's certainly not just property insurance. They need insurance for abuse liability. They're often dealing with vulnerable populations, such as children and the elderly. Um, they need coverage for directors and officers liability, as they cannot form boards. A lot of people want protection in order to get that coverage. Uh, so uh, volunteers, they're the only, uh, they're the primary type of organizations that have mass amount of volunteers, and so they have a unique type of insurance and uh, risk exposure on that front different than the for-profit community. So, and uh, Ms. Uh, Lindley Myers, you know, there's been, and Mr. Um, uh, Ber is it Bergner? Bergner. Bergner. Um, the same study, I think, showed that nonprofits, particularly smaller nonprofits, um, have limited access to property insurance coverage because it's, because the, bun like, bundling or something. Can you guys explain to me what that is and, and how this, is so, there, there's been some arguments that this coverage is amply available. And I know you guys have been kind of going back and forth about this, but if, if my mom is right now watching this, explain this in the simplest form. I really, it's important for people to understand it in a much more simple way of why this is, there's some disagreement here and what are, what are some of the core issues. Sure, thank you, Congressman. I, I appreciate the question. Um, so yeah, there has been a lot of discussion around bundling. Um, this is, this is a, uh, um, something that insurance companies will typically do in the marketplace because 
Uh, it's more efficient and cost effective to, to bundle two or, or, or more. Uh, different Do they like make more money doing it that way? Or? Uh, no, it typically provides savings to the consumer. This is something that the consumers in the marketplace have, have um, desired. And so you'll see it quite frequently if you, you know, turn on the TV and look at bottle, bundle your home and auto. So that's in the personal line side. In this case, the conversation is about bundling your liability and your property, right? Okay. So, um, and so this is what consumers typically are saying they want. Um, and, and so that's what many in the market tend to offer. I would just note, um, it's, it's a little, the kind of attack on bundling that I, I at least have heard um, uh, you know, throughout this debate is a little odd considering the purpose of, the, uh, of HR 4523 is to allow for bundling by risk retention groups. So. And, and I, I would agree uh, with Mr. Bergner, but I also want to you know, draw your attention to, the, at least the executive summary indicates that bundling is preferred because it is efficient and uh, it, it, it allows you, the, the, the carrier or it allows, in, in this case, a nonprofit to put all of that together. I've heard conversation about monoline, we just need property, we just need property, but the efficiency is in bundling and that is you know, the rationale for that. I'm sorry, I'll get to you, Mr. Mr. Hunter, you have something to add? Uh, well, I, th I think the problem with bundling is the liability part of the bundle of business owner property liability, uh, policy has liability in it, but it's not the kind of liability that's needed coverage? by the nonprofits. Is it less coverage? It's, it's coverage. It's liability coverage bundled with, with uh, property, which is efficient for most people. But, when you, but if, it doesn't, if the liability part doesn't offer what you need, you don't want to bundle. <laughs> you, want, you, want the, you want to go to your risk retention group, your RRG, which gives you exactly what you need, which covers the kinds of risks you have when you're dealing with volunteers and when you're dealing with the elderly and you're dealing with uh, sexually abused people and really difficult risks. You have to have tailored coverage. So the RRGs offer the tailored color, coverage. They'd have to give that up if they went to a bundle. They don't want to give it up. It. They want to add property insurance, and that's what the bill does. a lot does. of options there. And Ms. Go ahead, Ms. Robinson. Yeah, I just want to add that when you talk about a bundled program, as discussed here, those insurance companies have one idea of what they want to write, very black and white, in this little underwriting box of the type of risk they want to insure. So if there is an uh, organization, as I was discussing earlier today, like Black Lives Matter, where they don't want the liability, mm -hmm. they're not offering any coverage because what they're approved for is this one bundled option, further limiting the options that nonprofits have. And again, I see this. I'm on the ground. I work with nonprofits for a living. I'm talking to them every day, and I do thank, it for Thank you. I, I can see my vice chair has uh, learned a technique from Chairwoman Waters with the clicking. So I heard you. Yes. Thank you so much. I yield. <laughs> the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kustoff, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I don't know if anybody has stated this, but I, I would like to recognize our former colleague, Mr. Ross, who is here today in the audience, and it's, it's good to see him, and it was good to visit with him a week or so ago, and also to Ms. Lindley Myers, Commissioner, I direct, appreciate you, remember you from your days in Tennessee and your public service, and we certainly do appreciate it. Appreciate all the witnesses being here today. Mr. Bergner, if I, if I could, uh, we've heard everybody's opening statements and, and as it relates to data, can you, can you give us any evidence, if you will, is there any conclusivity as to whether uh, there is data to support an assertion that nonprofits have difficulty finding commercial property insurance at affordable rates? Uh, sure, thank you, Congressman. I, I can um, uh, at least address just a couple of points in that, in that space. Um, the first is, um, according uh, to the Urban Institute's uh, nonprofit center, there's uh, upwards of, I think the latest numbers are 1.56 million nonprofits, 78% uh, of which are 501c3s, which would put that number over 1.2 million. Um, we generally, in not seeing a crisis, and, and I would echo or um, acknowledge uh, colleague uh, Director Lindley Meyer's point that uh, the state insurance departments are not really seeing um, uh, folks coming to them and expressing a crisis of availability. Um, and so with that kind of number and at the overall level, and granted not all of them may need property insurance, conceded, stipulated, but 
one would, one would think this would be a lot more obvious than, than uh, it is. And then the second point, um, I know there's a lot of um, discussion uh, surrounding the Guy Carpenter study, such as it is, that sort of is to demonstrate that there is no availability. I can't really comment on um, kind of an assessment on that. It's the only thing that, to my knowledge, has ever been released is a two-page document summarizing a survey that was done. Um, and without any of the assumptions or search parameters or underlying data, I wouldn't feel comfortable being able to rely on that to change federal statute. So um, generally speaking, um, we don't think there's a lot of, uh, um, what word do you use, conclusive evidence uh, to suggest there, there is a crisis. Uh, do you have any concern as it relates to, to the bill that we're talking about and that's being considered, do you have any concern about um, the bill's regulatory approach and how it could ultimately or, or could it ultimately increase policyholders' risk, risk exposure? Well, we, we do. And I mean, in my opening statement, um, you know, I sort of uh, raised the issue of, by definition, you know, being substantially regulated only by your state of domicile means less oversight by fewer regulators. That's just inherent in the, in the uh, regulatory regime. So I think um, uh, our membership would, would say uh, this is a false choice. We don't have to choose between consumer protection and availability. We can have both. We've had it for 200 years uh, you know, with, with many of our companies. So, Thank you. And Director Lindley Myers, if I could with you, with your time in, in Tennessee as the, as the Deputy Commissioner, do you have any thoughts about whether a state like Tennessee could face risks not understood by, say, the insurance regulator in, in Vermont if this were enacted? I, I would say that having a RRG that is domiciled in Tennessee, I have no control in, in Missouri because I'm a non-domiciliary state. So any state that is the non-domiciliary state would have problems monitoring that RRG, knowing what's happening. We can't do market conduct exams. We don't know their financials. And in, in looking at a report from risk retention reporters, uh, when you look at the 10 to 15 year range, according to that, it was there were eight that were insolvent. One was for 15 years or more. And as you, so what, what you're looking at is, is the ability of that risk retention group to, uh, to operate and try to operate in some other jurisdiction that, that, that no, they know nothing about. Thank you very much. And my time is expiring. I'll yield back my time. Thank you to all the witnesses for appearing today. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair San Nicholas and Vice Ranking Member Gooden. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter from the Coalition Organized for the Future of Insurance Regulation expressing opposition to H.R. 4523, the nonprofit or Nonprofit Property Protection Act. Without objections. Uh, nonprofit organizations are often the lifeblood of the communities in which they serve. But the issue at hand here today really boils down to expanding risk retention groups and necessarily expanding the federal government's role in regulating insurance markets at the expense of our state regulated regime. Yes, in rare instances, Congress has acted to address insurance crises, but that has been when the size and scope of a problem rendered state-based solutions infeasible. One of these rare instances was, as we've heard expressed already, the, uh, the creation of risk retention groups in 1981 in response to the problems in the liability insurance market. And we can know the scope of Congress's intent when it created these risk retention groups by reading the accompanying committee report. Risk retention groups were not required to participate in insurance insolvency guarantee funds because Risk retention groups are not full-fledged, multi-line insurance companies, but limited operations providing coverage only to member companies and only for a narrow group of coverages. You have a lot of entities that started out with a very narrow purview, and then they want to get beyond that narrow purview. 
Ms. Lindley Myers, does H.R. 4523 allow risk retention groups to combine commercial property and liability insurance similar to what, um, to what admitted insurers would do? The, no. I mean, yes, they, they do, but the, the um, generally speaking, if there is an issue as far as a risk retention group, at least as it relates to Missouri, uh, and certainly in my time when I was in Tennessee. The, you're able to get it from the admitted market. If you can't get it there, we usually go to the surplus lines market. If you can't get it there, there is usually a residual market in which we can kind of go and get coverages for. So I, I, I don't, that's why I am staunchly believing that there isn't that kind of an issue because there are other, there are other services that are out there that go to the surplus lines, Uber is one, that goes to the surplus lines uh, market. It is, it is not the same as taxi cabs or whatever, and so they actually have a marketplace to go to. In your opinion, would this expand RRGs beyond what Congress originally intended when they were first created? In my opinion, yes. After speaking with officials in Tennessee about risk retention groups in general, I have to admit I'm concerned about opening RRGs up further, further, and our state officials share those concerns. The fact is, not only have our state officials not heard any concerns from nonprofits regarding the availability of commercial property insurance, but uh, they are evaluating, they are reevaluating at a policy level whether or not more RRGs should be allowed in the first place and they are very concerned about the lack of consumer protections for RRGs compared to admitted insurers. In Tennessee, two of the seven RRGs operating in the state are under enhanced supervision because they haven't worked out well. Mr. Bergner and Ms. Lindley Myers, do you know of any state in which commercial property coverage is unavailable to nonprofits? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. No. Are commercial insurers abandoning these nonprofit markets? Not to my knowledge, no. As it relates to Missouri, no. Ms. Lindley Myers, is it true that if this crisis did exist in a certain state, then state regulators could step in to reform how state admitted insurers sell both property and liability coverage and make these products more accessible? That is correct. In the uh, NAIC's comment letter that I uh, mentioned earlier, it's mentioned that the criteria to demonstrate coverage liability is illusory. What does the NAIC mean by that? Sorry. In each state, the, what, what we're looking at is that's why RRGs might be problematic. Each state has its own requirements, and that's what admitted carriers follow. And, it is fo and those requirements allow for consumer protections. It allows for, for, especially if an admitted carrier or a surplus line carrier is operating in more than one jurisdiction, it, it, it allows multiple eyes to look at that and assess. Thank, thank you. Our time has expired. I yield back. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Luke Kamara, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Ms. Lindy Myers. Good to see you again, fellow Missourian. Um, you know, I spent 30 plus years as an insurance agent, been in the business, was in the business for a long time. My son has my agency, and so uh, I'm, I'm kind of aware of uh, kind of what some of the issues you're talking about here. And it kind of concerns me a little bit by the way we're leading discussion here from the standpoint that, you know, we, we have a, a group that, uh, and I, when I was an agent, we tried to find places for nonprofits in my trade area, I, I tried to do this as well. So I, I understand your problem, and I'm not against risk protection groups, but I think if they, but for a good business practice here, for a good company to exist, it takes sound underwriting, um, it takes adequate capital, and you need to have a reinsurance program. Do most of these RRGs, or all of them, have reinsurance? Mr. Bergman? I don't have any specific information on that. Ms. Davis? 
Yes, absolutely. We have extensive reinsurance just for all of them that you're aware of have reinsurance. All of them that I'm aware of have reinsurance, absolutely, and okay. many, many of them are Ms. AM best rated as well. Ms. Linda Myers, everybody in Missouri have reinsurance. If there, if there's an RRG, that, to my knowledge, if there's an RRG that's operating within the state, it is not a Missouri-based, and they may or may not have reinsurance. It depends okay. on the the. The okay. Agency. As as a regulator, how often do you reg do you go in and look at the RRGs? Do you have oversight over them? I have oversight over those that are domiciled in Missouri. Missouri. Okay. Um, do you go? How often do you do you examine them? Generally, there's it's on a five year cycle. Five year cycle. Uh, do they submit annual reports to you? That you go over the annual reports. If you see something that's out of line, and can that trigger an examination? That is correct. Um, what kind of what kind of capital problems do you see or have you seen in some of these these RGs or have you seen any at all? I'm going to say that I haven't seen any in the almost three years that I've been there. No. Do any of they have a rate increase? Do they apply to you for to, to approve the rate increase? They do. What is your concern as the regulator um, with regards to the marijuana situation? Well, a lot of these insurance companies now, and I'm sure that Mr. Bergner can attest to this too, this is a burgeoning problem. It's gonna to have to be underwritten correctly and gonna to have to be rated correctly. And it's gonna to be, to me, a really big problem in the future with rate increases for all insurance companies, not just RRGs, but across the board. But I'm sure RRGs are gonna feel it just as much. And if you're nonprofit and you're squeezing dollars, all of a sudden this is gonna really impact, I think, an RRG. What is your opinion, Ms. Berg, uh, Lindy Myers? I would agree. Uh, it, is a, it is a concern. Um, we, we in Missouri just started um, uh, licensing agencies for marijuana you know, in various parts of the state. And we are having, as you know, I am also in charge of the finance, so financial uh, institutions, which includes credit unions and banks. A lot of them don't want to do it. There, there's some reticence in trying to provide such coverages. Doctors giving people prescriptions for it. There are some issues, as you know, I'm over the professional registration as well, and so they're very concerned about doing so. And so if you're an RRG and you are doing that sort of stuff in Missouri, I'm keeping a watch on that, but I have no idea what the laws may be like in Vermont or California or some other place. And that's why if you're in the non-domiciliary state, you should be taking a huge interest in RRGs. Well, this is a concern to me because I don't, I'm, I'm concerned that if, if you wind up with, with a lot of uh, claims, are we adequately capitalized? Do we, you know, uh, do you have adequate, uh, they're not, most of them are not apparently in the guarantee fund. Uh, Correct. And, and then we need to make sure we have reinsurance to be able to pick up the company in case it, 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 it struggles. And so, uh, Mr. Bergner, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I, you, you raise a very interesting, I think, emerging issue for the industry. I, I, like most things, I think the, um, you know, the private admitted market will uh, adjust to these things. I don't think that that market will adjust until we resolve the conflict between state and federal law. So my, my concern with this whole thing is that whenever, if, if the RRGs want to go down this road, they're going to have to understand that they're going to have to play by a different set of rules than they're playing with right now because you're getting into a whole different realm of different kinds of insurance. There are, there are different kinds. Of, this is liability and property and casualty. Is, that, that's apples and oranges. And you have to have expertise in this. Otherwise, there's exposure there, which if you don't have that expertise, you're going to be in a, in a big world of trouble. So with that, thank you very much for being here today, and I yield back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and uh, thank you to the witnesses for your participation today. Uh, like a lot of folks on my side of the aisle, I believe in, in the state-based regulatory framework. I think that's served our country very well. It's certainly served uh, my state of Ohio incredibly well, um, where we have some great insurance company, Westfield, Nationwide Progressive, uh, headquartered um, either in my district or nearby. Uh, and you know, to me, the only time it really makes sense for the federal government to be intervening is when there's a clear market failure, uh, like we've seen with TRIA or with Flood. Um, and, and I'll tell you, anecdotally, we called, I don't know how many, we called a, a handful of nonprofits um, who would supposedly have this issue. Uh, we called the state agency that, um, the state organization that many belong to, asking specifically 
whether there was a hole in the market um, or whether they've been hearing from their membership uh, about the issue that we're here to discuss today. I will tell you nobody said they saw an issue, um, certainly not one that rises to the level of a market failure that would suggest that the federal government should take a look at it. Um, so with that, I mean, as we know and have, and have heard today, uh, Congress created risk retention groups back in the 1980s to address what at the time was a crisis in the commercial liability insurance market, where some organizations at the time were unable to obtain adequate liability insurance because of the specific nature of their risk profile. Uh, and I think fulfilling that original purpose is fine, uh, but again, if RRGs want to expand beyond this scope, in my mind, they would become admitted insurers with, with all the consumer protections that affords. Uh, it seems ironic that the proponents of the legislation who claim that it is about making a product cheaper and more available to customers uh, are willing to bypass the capital and other regulatory requirements of admitted insurers designed to protect consumers. Mr. Bergner, am, am I incorrect here? I, I would imagine anything would be cheaper uh, if the entity providing the product had an advantage over its competitors in the form of less regulation. So, uh, no, I would say you're not incorrect here. Um, we've seen some studies that, that look into this, but the pricing benefits for risk retention groups flow directly from a relaxed regulatory regime. So in an insurance space, it's not possible to make a risk cheaper. To insure a risk, it is what it is, right? That's right. So, so um, that's the, the benefits flow. Uh, academics have looked at it and suggested something, something along the lines of 26% reduction in cost um, directly from this different regulatory regime. Yeah, uh, which makes sense. Um, and then Ms. Lindley Myers, in your testimony, you said that risk retention groups are prohibited from participating in state, state guarantee funds. Uh, what does this mean for policyholders should an RRG go insolvent? If an RRG goes insolvent, the policyholders of that RRG has to look to the RRG for its claim payment. And if there's no money there, they don't get it paid. At least with a state uh, guarantee uh, fund, there is some funds that are set up to pay the claims. Thank you. Uh, and then do you have any data on whether or not RRGs are more prone to insolvency compared to admitted insurers? Um, anybody on that? Director I, I guess I can just say, at least for um, in, tw in 2019, the state of Nevada clo uh, had to shut down a transportation RRG as well as a medical professional liability RRG. They both were placed in receivership uh, in 2019. And the, um, the transportation one was the eighth largest RRG in 2017 with a reported premium of $66.7 million. Wow. Um, that's awfully telling. Uh, and then, Mr. Bergner, in your testimony, you state, ultimately, if there is an interest among RRGs in expanding into other admitted lines markets, there is an option that some have already utilized, which avoided an unfair and unlevel playing field while ensuring customers are protected. Can you discuss further why you believe it is better for consumers and for RRGs to re reorganize as traditionally admitted insurance companies? Well, certainly, and I think the, uh, the conversation has been ongoing today at this hearing about, um, and I think Congressman Lukemeyer made the point specifically, I mean, these risks are different, um, and it's important for the folks that are offering the same products to be playing by the same rules. Uh, and so ultimately, if that's not the case, um, you have what creates a competitive uh, advantage that you know, could theoretically lead to um, adverse selection concerns, obviously broader concerns, things of this nature. So we, we just generally, we think that the, the thesis of my uh, testimony here today is, is very simple. Same products, play by the same rules. Thank you, and with that, I yield back. Gentleman from Ohio yields back. I recognize the gentleman from Guam, Mr. Sam Nickel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield the balance of my time to uh, my colleague, Mr. Green. Thank you for yielding, and um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, as well. Um, let's start with uh, Mr. Bergner. Uh, sir, you've indicated that uh, you do not have uh, these uh, RRGs in your state uh, supporting uh, entities in your state, is that correct? Well, so we actually do have risk retention group members in our membership, yeah. Yes, you, you have uh, we do. approximately 40 in your state, including the big brothers and big sisters in your state. Um, Ms. Davis, let me ask you now, uh, with reference to 
the insolvency. You wanted to give a response. Would you kindly do so, please? Yes, thank you very much. Um, just speaking about the regulation of risk retention groups generally, I think there's been misrepresentation because we have exactly the same capital standards uh, to maintain solvency that a traditionally licensed and admitted insurance companies do. There is no difference. And even I'm reading from the, NIA, the NAIC website right now that the NAIC accreditation program, under that, the regulation of uh, multi-state RRGs is similar to the regulation of commercial insurers. We have to comply with the quarter, quarterly and annual uh, requirements imposed on property casualty companies, including financial statements, managers discussion and analysis, risk-based capital, audited statement, actuarial opinions. I could go on and on. We also have risk-focused examinations. We have additional governance standards. There have been many, many, many things that the NAIC has done over the last 10 years to make sure that the regulation of risk retention groups and the required capital is consistent across all states and the same for risk retention groups as for commercial insurance companies. And I am surprised to hear the representative from NAIC not take credit for all the work that the NAIC has done to make sure that there is uniform regulation and the other states that are not domicile states have every opportunity, if they don't like the operation of a risk retention group in their state, they can ask for an examination by the, by the domicile state. If the domicile state doesn't do that, they can actually do the examination themselves and they can shut down that risk retention group in their state by taking them to court. So the, the regulation is very, very similar and the capital standards are the same. And um, let me move to uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Lindy Myers again, please. Uh, you indicated that you don't have um, any uh, RRGs in your state, is that correct? That, that indicates that there's a crisis. There is RRGs uh, uh, in the state. Yes, you're right, but that's not what you said earlier. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you have doing business with RRGs in your state some 213 different 501c3s. Uh, <clears throat> here's where we are. Currently, there is one company that offers the service that the RRGs um, would need, one. But the bill allows for certification by a given state that there is no crisis. The bill then allows for the RRG to cease and desist or not work in that state. But if it makes you comfortable, I'll be more than willing to amend the bill to accommodate you in this area, to make it such that uh, the, if there is an RRG functioning in the state, then it would have to uh, exit the state. But I don't think that that's the problem because it appears to me that the large insurance companies would rather see no RRGs. Let me ask you, uh, if I may, uh, Mr. Bergner, have you any experience with insuring these small 501c3s? None Personal, at all? Personally? Yes, sir. Any uh, experience? No. And uh, Ms. Uh, Lindy Myers, do you have any, any, any experience? With insuring them? No, I'm a yeah. state regulator, so okay. I don't so insure you, them. All right. Now let's go to Miss, um, um, and I, that would be Miss uh, Robinson. Uh, sure. You have some experience? Yes, I've been doing this for 15 years. And in your experience, given that you have experience, are there difficulties in getting the insurance? There are absolutely the difficulties, and I heard the example cited here today that there's been some risk retention groups who struggled. I just want to cite this narrow expansion of this law for nonprofits is what we're talking about here today. So not other groups, but nonprofits. So um, it is difficult, and I know that there were cited, they call I mean, you're the person who's had the experience. Yes. The others are giving us, at best, what someone else has told them. We call that hearsay. Yes. Uh, finally, if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to ask one additional question. Uh, is there any reason why an RRG should not move into this line of business other than you think that there is no crisis? I yield back the balance of my time. The uh, witness may answer if they choose. Davis, you can attempt. I, I can begin. 
actually having insured for 30 years the liability insurance for nonprofits, and in California, we insure also the property through a different uh, liability mechanism. Uh, we insure property and liability in California, and we've insured a liability for a very long time. It is much more difficult to insure this long tail liability. We have sexual abuse cases that might come 40 years after the fact. The fact that uh, little nonprofits have survived and being relegated to only insure the liability, that's the difficult line of business. And I have also insured property, and so I have very much experience with that, and it is a much more predictable uh, line to do, especially for little nonprofits in the type of property that they have. We are not high risk. Thank you for your response. Uh, Ms. Uh, Lindley Myers. Yes, I just wanted to, to make sure that you know it's understood that it's the non-domiciliary state of these RRGs that has no um, view on what's going on with these RRGs that are that are capitalized in another state, mm -hmm. and that uh, it leads to less consumer protection, which is what my job is. And I've been doing been in regulation for 38 years, so I you know I have seen what has been out there, and I have not encountered one nonprofit that has come into any of the states that I've been in, from Connecticut, Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, back to Missouri again, that has said, I can't find any coverage. Thank you for that response. I, I will go to the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, the Entrepreneurship and Capital Markets is now recognized for five minutes. Um, as the gentleman from Ohio pointed out, we have a system of state-based uh, regulation of insurance. Um, I think that's worked well. It was tested in the 2008 um, catastrophe to our economy. Um, most of the opposition to this bill, as far as I can see, is a fear of departing from that uh, concept of state regulation. Um, the, uh, Ms. Uh, Bergner, uh, uh, I understand uh, in my own state of, uh, or Mr. Bergner, and I've also addressed this to Ms. Davis, uh, I understand that state that Ms. Davis and I share, California, um, they, they've already taken steps to provide a mechanism so that nonprofits can acquire commercial property uh, coverage. Um, why can't other states simply do what California did so that we don't have to be here? Well, it, it's a good, thank you, Congressman. It's a good question. And um, I, I, when we talk about this, we talk about kind of a cascade of options for 501c3s, right? So starting in seeking to uh, obtain coverage somehow through the admitted market, whether it's directly from primary carriers, uh, having RRGs do fronting arrangements with other admitted carriers to figure out how to sell products where they need to. Um, and then from there, the surplus lines market that we've talked yeah, about uh, a little uh, bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you short and go to, to Ms. Davis. Sure. Uh, you've yes. talked to me about this bill and its concept for a long time. California solved the problem. What's the matter with these other 49 states? So this is the reason that it, it works in California because California is so geographically spread and there are so many nonprofits that we actually have enough nonprofits there to pool together and that we can do it together. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's, there's maybe one other state that this would make sense. It would be irresponsible for smaller states to try to do this with just the nonprofits in just the state. So it shouldn't be limited just to a small state or two. It has, it has to, to be, be multi-state, yeah. but you could very well have the states uh, do this without the federal government. Um, it would not work. Um, okay, um, in our state, um, we've got like 90 some thousand nonprofits, 20,000 of them uh, have insurance through uh, these risk retention groups. Are the others able to get coverage elsewhere or what's happening in California? So we've always said that there are other limited uh, options for nonprofits for package coverage. We, we're not talking about, we're talking about the absence of standalone property insurance. We cannot be the only carrier for nonprofits in the country, and we have no intention to be. 
I will tell you, across the, the country, we now insure in the states we're in about 7% of the nonprofits. And you say, that might not be a very large share. In California, it's actually 20%. Mm -hmm. But Berkshire Hathaway insures 6.5% of their market. We are a very important part of this market. Most insurance companies now, don't insure more you than that. You point out that these risk retention groups face the same kinds of regulation that you would if you were a mutual insurance company. Uh, but you're not regulated by every state in which you do business. And I understand that. I mean, if you were going to be a mutual, it sounds like that's the one advantage you have, and the cost of being regulated in every state you do business uh, could, be, uh, could be burdensome. On the other hand, I see that chart right in front of us saying 35% of the RRGs are, are in Vermont, and I don't think that's where 35% of the business is. Um, my concern is Wyoming could have a, a hear no evil, see no evil approach to regulation. Somebody could be domiciled there and then do business in my state. Uh, uh, I'm going to address this to Director uh, Lindley uh, uh, Meyer. What do we do not to make these groups subject to registration in all 50 states, but register in those states where they do a tremendous amount of business or a substantial, you know, over half or over a third of their business? The, the issue with the bill as presented is that the non-domiciliary state doesn't have the uh, look-see of what's going on with that particular And that, that's RRG. what I'm addressing. If you had the look-see, uh, but not because they have one policy in your state, but because a third of their business was in your state, would that provide enough state regulation to these organizations? If they're going to abide by the state regulation within my state, absolutely. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, is, Thank can, you. can Ms. Davis give a quick response? We'll get to Ms. Davis. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And let me uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Robinson and Ms. Davis, a, a Guy Carpenter study from 2017 found that nonprofits have very few options when it comes to obtaining property insurance coverage, especially small and mid-sized nonprofits. Can you help us understand why it is harder for nonprofits as compared to other businesses to obtain the insurance coverage that they need. And we'll start with Ms. Robinson. Sure, and I want to start by, I don't want to discount the fact that there are some nonprofits, more of the vanilla, very easy risk, who do obtain insurance and who do have options. The nonprofits that we're representing and speaking here today are those who are doing the hard work, homeless shelters, domestic violence shelters, foster care, vulnerable populations, the elderly, the mentally ill, the harder work that we all here don't do for a living. Those are who we're representing today. So the re reason why it's harder for that subset, subgroup of nonprofits to obtain coverage is because with these bundled programs, they, only, they, want, they have to do the liability and the property together. They're not looking at it as a separate risk. So if they say we don't want to have our uh, we don't want to be subjected to, for example, in a homeless shelter, the mentally ill or some sort of um, claim arising out of someone who might have a, a mental breakdown, then no, sorry, we don't we can't do any of it. We won't do the property. The reality is they want a very black and white, only the vanilla risk, the easier risk to insure. And but for having this other risk, the the option of the risk retention group, they are struggling. And I encourage the folks here today uh, opposing this bill yep. to get on the phones with the organizations who are on the ground, who are being subject, subjected to the hard market and to these challenges. And, and so thank you for that response. Ms. Davis, they do provide a unique form of services which require probably some type of unique insurance coverage to, uh, to help them. Yes, absolutely. And the property insurance is just the part that is we, our members can't get access to because it's available only as a bundle package, as we say, but the liability doesn't always work for them. And I've given many examples, and I, I, I would like to, to just say that there are organizations that have come to us recently, the Ann Grady Services of Holland, Ohio. They actually could not find any coverage 
They've been operating since 1982. We were their only option. They have 400 community members that work for them. They're a large organization. Nobody would insure them. The Children's Shelter of San Antonio, Texas, they could not get anything because they were insuring foster family agency uh, organizations. Sun Ministries in Minnesota, they came to us. No one else would insure them because they work in the inner cities. Uh, Mountain True, it's an environmental organization in North Carolina. They said they have been canceled twice, and they were so relieved they could finally find coverage with us. And then finally, Mid-Delta Community Services, Southeast Arkansas, they had an increase of $200,000 from their insurer, and they could not come up with that additional money. Their insurance broker went to seven other carriers and got turned down. He could not find anybody to cover them. This nonprofit then advertised in the newspaper because they were desperate for anybody to insure them, and their insurance broker found us at the last minute. They provide Head Start to seven counties in their, in their uh, community, and we were the only ones that would insure them. And that's all about essential services that our entire community depends on. Ms. Davis, risk retention groups currently make up a relatively small portion of the commercial liability insurance market with only 1% of the total premiums. If H.R. 4523 were to become law, how much do you think risk retention groups would grow? How many more would there be? I actually think that the, the risk, there are not many more risk retention groups would grow, but I think the measure is the impact this would have on the nonprofit sector. So let's look at the fact that it's not uh, one percent of the market, but for us right now, we insure seven percent of the market. And in fact, we actually insure thirteen percent of the nonprofit organizations in Missouri. So there must be more of a problem there than the commissioner is aware of. We insure a very large portion of the nonprofits in Missouri. So I think that the difference will be the impact on the nonprofit organizations. The insurance industry is not going to feel the impact of this but the nonprofit organizations are going to be able to do their services. And, and I thank you for your response. And I would hope uh, that when this hearing is concluded that the two sides could get together and find some middle ground on this issue. Help us, help us here. Help us with this process of making sausage. Uh, at this time, I will recognize uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, for five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Bergner, it's been said that uh, allowing risk retention groups to offer property coverage to nonprofits means that the traditional insurance companies will face competition from risk retention groups. I like competition, but uh, please explain how this might create unfair competitive disadvantages to traditional, to traditional carriers. Uh, and the impacts of those disadvantages. And I know this is similar to another question. I'm just looking for some more specifics. Sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, we've heard a lot of discussion about it's a different regulatory uh, regime, but not, you know, it's equivalent in some way. Um, well, the fact is, you know, it's not an equivalent regulatory regime. Um, and if it were, uh, well, there's got to be a reason there's a, staunch opposition to becoming an admitted carrier, right? So there, there's a reason that that regulatory regime is more <laughs> preferable to operate under. Uh, and, and some of the, the provisions of H.R. 4523, for example, that, that seek to um, address some of the potential regulatory concerns, we don't um, think necessarily get there. I mean, we, we, when a non-domiciliary state, per um, Director Lindley Myers, wants to take a look at something or, or doesn't uh, get the cooperation from the domiciled state's regulator, they have to take them to court. And it's legally questionable in many cases whether okay. LRRA would, would allow for that court to find in favor of the, the state of domicile. So, okay. You know, Congress created risk retention groups and, and shielded them from state regulation in all states where they offer coverage to address the perceived crisis uh, that there was uh, when commercial firms had difficulty obtaining product liability coverage. Uh, in this attempt to expand the role of risk retention groups to property coverage for nonprofits, there appears to be no such crisis. Uh, can you tell us about the availability currently, and if, in fact, we are facing a, quote, crisis? 
Sure, thank you. So uh, we don't believe we are facing a crisis, and, and you know, speaking to specifics of anecdotes, um, I, I can't do without you know more knowledge about specific circumstances. But to offer my own you know anecdotal uh, story about speaking to independent insurance agents, who I would note are also opposed to this legislation, um, they seem to have a lot of conversations with their membership, and they they have not reported any similar crisis uh, when they go out into the market. They say sometimes it's difficult to find, but we can find it for them. I would also note that the admitted market is just one of the options for a 501c3. There's the surplus lines market, there's residual risk market mechanisms like fair plans in many states. I did a cursory uh, Google search of five of them in preparation for this hearing and found commercial property, standalone coverage, through these residual market mechanisms. So there, there are options uh, that, would, that would suggest there's no- Okay, I got another question for you, then I want to go to Ms. Davis, but um, I've heard from an RG that uh, there's simply no way that they could restructure as an admitted carrier uh, because they simply wouldn't be able to offer the products to their clients at reasonable prices. Uh, but as I understand it, your membership has a number of smaller carriers selling policies to diverse clientele uh, many times for niche markets. Uh, so my curiosity is, how's that working for them? Well, uh, I, you know, come on in, the water's warm. The, uh, the, our membership has been doing this successfully for, in me most cases, over 100 years. And there are, there are folks that write for niche markets exclusively for houses of worship and related ministries that these organizations do in all 50 states. Um, and so uh, there, there are plenty of examples of, of companies that have figured out how to do this successfully uh, to the benefit of their policyholders across the country. Okay. Ms. Davis, you want to comment? Yes, I did. Uh, first of all, we have a special condition. We cannot become a licensed admitted carrier because we're a 501N organization under federal law, and it requires us to be uh, organized as a nonprofit under state law provisions authorizing risk sharing arrangements for charitable organizations not to be a licensed insurance company. So we would be bankrupt if we had to, to if we were able to do that. However, I wanted to uh, point out that uh, this is a crisis, and you're going to be hearing about it. If, if you don't uh, believe me, you'll hear it about it in the future. I have a statement here from Peter Pursuti. He's the managing director of Gallagher, which is of the nonprofit practice at Gallagher. He has written, and this will be published very soon, he says, Gallagher believes an insurance crisis is now for many nonprofits. They're a large broker. This is not a one-size-fits-all reaction to pricing in terms in the market. is not hardening consistently. Certain geographic areas like the Northeast, Southeast, and Texas are experiencing reduced limits as much as 40% rate increases and even non-renewals. I have another email about a conversation with a broker okay. just today who indicated that the largest insurer of package coverage for nonprofit organizations in the country has said that they will be non-renewing their foster care, their adoption, and all their residential business. Thank you. The gentleman from Florida time has expired. The gentleman from Mar North Carolina, Mr. Budd, is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman. Uh, Mr. Bergner, again, thank you for your time and for each of you for being here. So is there any real evidence that a high percentage of nonprofits across the country are, that are uninsured or are shutting down or failing because of the high cost of insurance? Uh, we, we have not seen any compelling evidence to suggest that's the case. Uh, do you think that this is perhaps just a, a way for a less regulated entity to sell a product at a cheaper price? Well, that would be the result of the pursuit of this particular remedy in H.R. 4523, yeah. So that really wouldn't be a very level playing field, then would it? So let's talk about McCarran-Ferguson for a second, which is jeopardized by this bill being considered. So taken from the NAIC website, the McCarran, this is a quote, the McCarran-Ferguson Act declared that the continued regulation and taxation by the several states of the businesses of insurance is in the public interest, and that silence on the part of the Congress should not be construed to impose any barrier to the regulation or taxation of such businesses by the several states. It affirmed from then on that, quote, no act of Congress shall be construed to invalidate, impair, or supersede any law enacted by any state for the purpose of regulating the business of insurance, end quote. So in my view, if there was a crisis, then state regulators could step in 
to reform how state-admitted insurers sell both property and liability coverage, and they can make these products even more accessible. So we should not create a nationwide loophole to allow these risk retention groups to do something that is best handled in the state level. And then that would also jeopardize the state system of insurance, uh, which is, by the way, the gold standard of the world. So Mr. Bergner, much has been said today about a Guy Carpenter study taken over three months in the summer of 2017, which looked at insurance's service office or ISO filings concerning the availability of a standalone or monoline policies covering commercial property and auto coverage. So what I don't think has been talked about nearly as much as it should be is the fact that the folks asking for the study to be performed did so in search of the answer that they received. Just like HR 4523, in my mind, this question was a solution in search of a problem. So Mr. Bergner, would you agree with my assertion here? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, um, it's hard for me to offer a real assessment of this study in that it's only been a two-page document that's released with sort of the conclusions. I, I would you know, admit I found some of the language in that document oddly specific, and so I would want to dig in a little bit to the search parameters of this survey, understand the underlying assumptions and, and the data that was produced. Um, if, you know, of a type searched, um, the language that was used was of a type used by 501c3 organizations. I don't understand exactly what that means or how you would define a search by that. Um, and so I would want to understand that a little better before I, I would be, um, you know, eager to, to rely on that as, as uh, the basis for changing federal statute. Um, and, and, you know, regardless, the, the, the survey does not discuss, um, I think, perhaps some more interesting questions that could be asked along the lines of how are uh, you know, other 1.2 million 501c3s transferring their risk successfully today in the market. Um, it, you know, and so this, this doesn't address that or any of the various options that one might have outside of monoline coverage in an admitted market. Very good. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the remainder of my time. I thank the gentleman for yielding back, and uh, I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for your testimony today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I would love to see uh, both sides uh, to leave this hearing and come up with a working document um, to present to this committee, uh, because I, I have a feeling that this issue is not going to go away and that we will persist. And uh, hopefully we can find middle ground uh, on the two sides and realize that this is an important issue and we do need to take care of our nonprofit community. So I would, I would hope that we could, uh, that you could get with the sponsor, the house sponsor, and find a way forward. And with that, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able and without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. This hearing is adjourned.